Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, this is uh, TPA Global. Uh, welcome to our webinar on 10 practical tips on country by country reporting. This webinar is a direct result of the release by the OECD on the 29th of September of their report, uh, Web Section 13, country by country reporting, and then very specifically the handbook on effective tax risk assessment. Uh, the presenters for today, aside from myself, are going to be Verinda Sharma and Victor Denikamp. Uh, Verinder is a partner in our office, um, Victor is, a, is an associate, and myself, I'm one of the senior partners of the company. All right, country by country reporting, not something that you have heard for the first time. Um, as we know, it's, uh, it's an element of the uh, Web Section Report number 13. And it belongs to, you know, basically what we refer to as the four minimum standards that were uh, issued by the OECD and the MAPS project, of which harmful tax, um, uh, harmful tax is one. The treaty abuse is another one. Action 13 on, uh, on on transfer pricing documentation is the third one, and the minimum requirements around disp dispute resolutions uh, is a, is the number four. Um, as you may have noticed, with also the MLI being signed, all the, the countries involved, we have seen now more than 55 jurisdictions that are already going into uh, CBC reporting requirements uh, by law. Uh, some of them are effective for the financial year 17 or later. Others have already included financial year 16 as their requirement for reporting, which means at the end of the year, uh, for some countries, there is already the obligation, which effectively triggers that a lot of uh, companies already have to disclose uh, at the end of this year relating to financial year 16. Um, what is also good, again, to know, and that's what I just indicated, is that this uh, report that has come out, the handbook, so to speak, is one of the four uh, documents that the OECD in its inclusive framework on BAPS uh, has released, is releasing, and it is basically part of the four that you see here. There is a guidance on the implementation of CBC reporting, which a number of you have already seen, uh, on the appropriate use of information contained in the CBC reports, more for tax authorities, uh, handbook on effective implementation and effective tax risk assessment, and it's the latter that we're going to be discussing is again more uh, uh, guidance also for tax authorities on how should they read, how can they read um, the CBC report that you will be producing for purposes of assessing whether there are tax risks uh, involved that they should be asking more questions on or to say it in a different way that you know maybe leads to an audit effectively. Can we go to the next page please Victor? Okay, so the handbook on effective tax risk assessment is what we're going to be discussing. I'm not going to, you know, go through each and every chapter here, but in short, I think the chapters four, five, six, seven are probably the more relevant ones, where four is uh, is probably, you know, key. What is, you know, what can a tax authority do in order to um, create its own risk assessment framework? by looking at um, the data that it is receiving from all the M&Es. There's obviously a, a, a huge uh, pool of data coming in, and how are they going to look at the data, how can they best sort the data, and how can they best then analyze the data for purposes of, as we said before, a, assessing whether from their perspective a company has been shifting income, or has been reducing the tax base, etc. So that's basically the goal of this report. If we go to the next slide, um, the OECD has indicated in this report basically 19 different ratios or indicators that they are advising, you know, basically the tax authorities to look at. What you see here is a short description of what is the potential indicator on the left-hand side and what is you know, what could it mean? How, how could such an indicator or such an analysis translate into, yeah, potential wrong behavior of a tax uh, payer, uh, w whether they have shifted income or not? 
if I highlight maybe a couple of them, if you look at number three, uh, when you have a high level of intercompany uh, transactions, uh, where you have a high, you know, related party revenue in your table one compared to the total group revenue, that might be one indication that at least this M&E has the opportunity to have prices between related party where it could, I'm going to use in inverted commas the word play, um, to obviously shift income left or to the right. Uh, that's one element uh, to, to look at. The other one is, for instance, uh, number six, and this is probably where uh, a lot of people have been focusing on as well, is where are the FTEs, where are they not, uh, how does it compare to, um, you know, profitability? Do we have low level of FTEs with high profitability, yes or no, or vice versa? So if you take, you know, six and actually seven and eight as well into consideration, you would be looking at, um, you know, FTEs, uh, full-time equivalents. You could start looking at, okay, where are the significant people functions? Uh, if you do a ratio analysis with FTEs and you do another one with significant people functions, you will be able to get completely different numbers and thus also completely different pictures on where profitability arguably could sit. So again, if you look at those three, six, seven, eight, they have the potential of being an indicator for the tax authorities to say, okay, if we see some anomalies there, why don't we start asking questions? If we go to the next page and we take, for instance, 11, 12, and 13, where we look at IP, uh, where we look at marketing, where we look at uh, procurement, also those are what we would refer maybe as more mobile type of roles and responsibilities where a multinational may have the ability to place them in a favorable tax jurisdiction. And these are again elements where you know the OECD is indicating to the tax authorities if you can have a look at these elements and see certain ratios kicking in, and we will show you later on a couple of examples, then that might be again an indicator. So it's not to say, oh, if you have this, then by definition you have a problem. As long as they're justifiable, you can still argue why a jurisdiction with low number of FTEs but a very high level of significant people functions should be making a, a reasonable margin, and that margin is then probably high comparable to other jurisdictions with low value driving FTEs. Um, as long as you can justify it doesn't mean that you have a problem, but it is at least for tax authorities an indicator to ask a question. Um, if you look at, for instance, number 16, sorry, number 15. If number 15 is quite interesting as well, because if your tax paid, so your cash out, versus tax accrued, and you know, in the first year you can see the difference, but if you do a year-on-year -year comparison going forward, if every time your cash tax paid stays relatively low, but your accrued is significantly higher, that suggests at least that you are booking a reserve for tax exposures. So in the US GAAP language, I would refer to it as uh, FIN48. And that is an indicator that you believe that you have some tax risk. And that could be, again, for tax authorities, an indicator that if you do that, why do you do that? Can you please explain? So again, uh, an, an indicator for asking questions. Number 18 is another one, uh, you know, with stateless or, uh, and that's actually also if you look at 19, um, if you have income which is apparently not taxed in, in one jurisdiction because it's stateless, uh, how does it get picked up in another country? Do you want to explain that? Uh, where would you explain that? Is that a table three uh, uh, element that you want to use? Or are you just leaving it as such and then there is stateless income and the tax authorities can say, okay, that's again an indicator for us to start asking uh, the next question. With that, I would like to give the floor to you, Victor, for the next slide. Uh, and Raymond, just one important point I want to highlight for the audience is that 
except where we have a high related party revenue and uh, and in that jurisdiction we also have high effective tax rate then one can argue that uh, there is a less risk because of intercompany dealings but if I look at all other indicators in most of the cases the tax authorities they still have to look at master file and local file before they can draw a proper conclusion right so another example could be where we have uh, high profits in uh, one location with uh, less number of people and uh, and lower share of uh, related party revenue then one needs to possibly even look at significant people function which I cannot check from C by CR so the point I'm making is that in most of the indicators uh, wherever we have a red flag invariably we have to go down to uh, other layers of uh, documentation which is a master file and local file to take a conclusive decision on it okay so now we've seen um, the, the the different uh, text indicators the 19 text indicators now the question is how are we going to detect these uh, text risk in indicators and what is uh, common practice for tax authorities uh, what kind of techniques are they are using to, to detect these uh, tax risk indicators so under the, the handbook uh, there is a section which is describing um, describing uh, multiple techniques uh, uh, some tax authorities uh, around the world are using and this uh, this table is just a an, uh, an, uh, limited uh, table it, it shows only a couple of countries but it's clear that uh, countries not only use uh, manual risk uh, detection uh, techniques but also automated uh, detection techniques if we look at uh, for example table 1 and table 2 of the of the, the the country by country report reporting template it's clear that these kind of uh, um, templates are very easy to assess by a computer so the, there is an, a, a purpose for this to run this kind of templates through the uh, uh, reports through the computers uh, by using automated uh, risk uh, detection uh, techniques so um, what this slide shows is um, uh, an example of what kind of um, uh, uh, ratios uh, can be used to detect these uh, uh, tax risk indicators especially uh, the, the I think the ratio analysis based on, on numbers uh, in the table one are one of the the, the, the better methods to to detect the the, the 19 uh, uh, tax risk indicators um, this is just an, an, a simplified way of, of looking at it uh, there are m many more uh, ratios uh, which can be used uh, to detect uh, the tax risk indicators but it clearly shows uh, some uh, numbers in these examples which are definitely outliers as to if, if you compare this to the, the groups average or for example to the industry's uh, average so I just highlighted uh, one of the outliers underneath this table but um, in the end there can still be any other uh, numbers uh, being outliers uh, under this uh, table so this is just a an, an, an different way of visualizing the, the outliers under the under the previous table uh, you clearly see that some uh, jurisdictions or countries in the respective jurisdictions are being outliers when we look uh, for example uh, to revenues per employee and uh, one important point is that although for us uh, this uh, uh, indicator tells us uh, country n as an outlier but that is mainly based on revenue and if you just look at revenue it still doesn't give us a full picture because you have to use other tax risk indicators to take a conclusive judgment on this so in this example we have country N which is an uh, outlier in the sense uh, it has the highest revenue per employee but to know that whether this is a full risk distributor or a limited risk distributor it's not possible to know uh, from C by CR so one has to go and look at local file similarly if you look at this country I 
which has the lowest revenue uh, 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 per employee. Now, this could be an agent or this could be uh, a kind of a, a, a support function. So if it's an agent, then it should be earning commission, but to know whether it's an agent or it's a cost plus a market support service provider, one has to go to table two and also look at local files. So the message is that it's not uh, easy to conclude just using one indicator. We have to use in conjunction with other indicators which are mainly profit-based tax risk indicators and also use local file wherever we see these red flags have to be uh, understood further. This is obviously, you know, looking at the approach if you are looking at it from your side as a company. Um, but if you look at it uh, from the side of the tax authorities, the only thing they will see if they run these analysis based on these outliers, they will say, okay, country N, making a lot of margin, um, making you know a high number uh, in terms of uh, revenue or profit per employee. It is also funny if you look then in the CBC table what this country N has as a tax rate, it seems to be showing a zero. And that in combination is at least for tax authorities an indicator. And as Firenda said, I, you know, th there is obviously a bigger story to be told why this might be valid and not something that automatically creates a tax risk. But I think what is very relevant uh, for, for an M&E in this context is to understand you know, what kind of indicators, what kind of red flags are the tax authorities seeing from their end with maybe now more information but still in the eyes of the tax authorities, no doubt, limited information. It just triggers the question. So if I were to be sitting in the chair of a tax inspector, I would ask the question, why is country N, with whom my country is dealing with in terms of intercompany transactions, because that's what I can see in my local file, why is it making so much more than my little country P, which is on the low end on the, um, on the earnings per, F, per FTE? So it's an indicator, again, Victor. Yeah, so then uh, we have another example on uh, profit per employee, and this is uh, definitely, uh, if we, 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 we relate this to, to BEPS, this is definitely one of the, the, the more important uh, outliers. Again, you see uh, uh, here the, the, the relevant uh, countries uh, as being the, one of the outliers. Um, yeah, still these are indicators, and it doesn't mean that, that these countries are also Having a, an, a, an a higher risk of BEPS, but uh, we also have to to have to look uh, to have to look to uh, the activities of the of the the countries and uh, to Table Two or any other uh, documentation, uh, for example, uh, local files, uh, etc. And here also similar similar to previous slides, I will not stop just looking at uh, this indicator because if you see country N, it has higher uh, profit before tax per employee, uh, but if we have a high share of related party revenue in the total revenue in this jurisdiction, then one can argue that uh, this entity might be principal with high significant people function, right? And to know high significant people function, one has to check the local file. Yeah. Similarly, when we look at country C, uh, which has uh, the lowest profit before tax, now, unless I have a high related party uh, uh, revenue share, I could have that, but Possibly I'm spending uh, more efforts uh, when I'm dealing with third parties uh, or possibly from a third party business segment and that might be dragging down my profit. So one has to go further to apply other indicators and check qualitative uh, information which is there in the local file to draw a, a complete conclusion on this. So the next slide, I think, um, clearly shows um, an, an, an indicator which is uh, maybe not uh, uh, included under the, the, the handbook, but which is kind of interesting to look at, which is the relationship uh, between uh, profit per employee and the effective tax rate. And 
especially the, 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 the countries, the jurisdictions, or the entities which are on the, the left side, the, the top left side, are the most relevant uh, countries to look at because um, it, it, it shows that, that, that companies are, or that there is a risk that companies are really planning uh, um, uh, their, their, um, their profits uh, to low uh, tax jurisdictions. In this case, uh, uh, country uh, jurisdiction N or uh, entity which is uh, um, established in this uh, particular jurisdiction. Now here using we are using here two indicators and and this gives a good grip on deciding whether there is any tax risk here. So if you look at country N, which has high profit before uh, tax but has low effective tax rate, the next question is that. Uh, let's go to uh, table two and check whether we have uh, uh, jurisdiction uh, which are into research and development uh, activities. And if the same country is also into R&D activities, then the next question could be that this might be taking some uh, innovation box benefits. So then you have to go uh, and check local file and other documents. So, but this uh, this country and is a clear uh, red flag for tax authorities to go deeper into the facts. Yeah, and I think definitely the next slide, uh, which is showing the relationship between uh, the related party revenues and the effective tax rate, is also applicable to the to the the the, the thing you just said, uh, Virender, where uh, you see in the top left corner uh, the the jurisdictions with uh, a high proportion of uh, of related party revenues. Which uh, also have uh, an, uh, an, um, an, uh, an low uh, effective tax rate. So this is definitely an indicator also uh, for uh, uh, BEPS-related uh, activities. Yeah. Okay. So, so then basically, we are going to, yeah, Raymond. Sorry, sorry, Victor. Uh, so basically, we've just shared with you what we refer to as our first tip is really understand what what does a tax authority do or what can they do or what kind of analysis can they run from their perspective from their limited view which could trigger all sorts of questions in their mind which they just have to put on a piece of paper write to you in a letter be ready for that that's what that was our tip one or tip two is you know, taking into account what you probably all are doing already is how can you determine what for you could be risk indicators and how how do you, you know, act on them. So in other words, what techniques are you applying already for yourself as a as a as an indicator for potential tax risk in the new in the new brave uh, post BEPS world, if you will. Um, so make sure that you have a good handle on that is definitely one of the tips. Um, we have here a bullet point which is talking about real-time checks or maybe real-time audits. Our tax authorities are already doing audits in real-time. Um, I think if you, if you take now 2017, you will file the 16 data. Are the tax authorities coming in already maybe to look at 17 on real-time? It's a, it's a question, um, but if they were to do that, what would they use as data points out of the CBC already into checking how 17 is running? Um, and actually, one could say, well, there is not real time yet in, in that sense, but there is now a, a seven-country group already which is looking at, um, you know, a, a, an approach to work together and create what they refer to maybe as best practices for um, you know the screening uh, of these kind of uh, indicators or, or information that comes out of CBC. Um, the countries are mentioned here and it is referred to as the International Compliance Assurance Program which is actually um, a voluntary program so to speak that will use CBC reports uh, and other uh, information uh, but it also is trying to create a communication and uh, an open dialogue with an m and &E to discuss with multiple tax authorities about its position uh, that it is taking for tax purposes. 
with a with an aim or a view to get to early tax certainty and assurance. This is what these authorities are trying to do, and you can see these are most most mostly the more uh, well-known and developed uh, taxing authorities, um, and they want to get a better handle on your day-to-day -day activities and assess from a tax point of view whether you are you know shifting profits yes or no so be aware of that and um, I think in this particular case proactivity is probably a very good advice uh, for you to take home as a, uh, a tip to assess your own tax risk and handle in accordance with what you're picking up and try to remedy where necessary Okay, can we go to the next slide? Here we go, a little bit backtracking, you know, what is in table one? What are elements in there that you could potentially have a look at a bit more critically and make sure that you start building a consistent picture because you're going to be filing something now for the year 2016, but next year is coming already where you have to file for uh, 2017. And how are you going to ensure consistency? How are you going to ensure, you know, a same approach? Which means that, you know, if you go to the next slide, please, um, Victor. How have you, for instance, determined the terminology employees? How did you take those into account? Did you take in only the people that are on your payroll? Did you include contractors? And if you did, how did you include them? How did you take a cutoff? Um, we know that OECD obviously give you, you know, some discretion to judge whether you need to take contractors on board or not. But if you did, then you probably, for consistency purposes, have to do it again next year. And how do you deal with, you know, keeping at least that consistent picture on on bringing these people on board? The same is true. We know from certain clients and certain M&Es that they have also made manual modifications uh, because you basically maybe get data and the data in, in the eyes of the tax people might not necessarily be as representative as one wanted to be. So if you have done uh, manual uh, adjustments, how can you ensure that in the next round you do it in the same way and that it is again consistent, as it's traceable, but probably more important that it is also credible. So again, make sure that you document yourself very well into how you run your CBC in the 16 period for purposes of running it in a similar way or at least in a consistent way in the subsequent years. Um, one more element, and we alluded to it already um, during the uh, you know the discussions of these ratios in country N, we as an organisation TPA have run now a number of what we can refer to as sort of uh, benchmarks, where we looked at industries, at different industries, and at different positions in industries that companies can have, to figure out okay what is an industry, for instance a return uh, a revenue per FTE, or a profit per FTE. Tax authorities obviously will have similar data available, and if they don't have it yet, they will definitely get their hands on it when everybody that is in a given industry is filing a CBC. So they will start to see not only outliers in terms of revenue per, per FTE or profit per FTE within your organization, they can also start to see how does it stack up compared to other players in your industry. If if you take, for instance, that the industry is on average, you know, I'm, I'm just throwing out a number, 100,000 per FTE, and you are consistently in the number of countries already above that number, and within the group, uh, you have a clear indicator that some countries are way below, and they happen to be the high-tax jurisdiction, and the ones that are above are and significantly above are the low-tax jurisdictions, you know, is that giving the authorities even more information? So just, you know, be aware what they can do with this information and what kind of information they will use to assess where you are in the range. So I could arguably, with this example, create a model where tax authorities say, well, anybody above the, 
the 100,000 is making too much, so that's a correction, and the ones that are below, they will say, at least I want to have the 100,000 per FTE in my country. It's probably too quick and dirty, but it is, again, one of those indicators. So, you know, how comparable is it? Is then the next question, et cetera, et cetera. We know all how that works, but just be aware on how this whole data dump that's going to take place uh, is going to arrive at tax authorities and what they can do with it. Okay, can we go to slide 17, Victor, or Verenda? Yeah, so uh, coming back to the consistency uh, topic, this is definitely another way how tax authorities in the future will look at uh, uh, the CBCR by comparing uh, multiple years of the CBCR. This table shows uh, the differences between, um, now in this example, uh, between 16 and 17 of uh, table 1. Um, well, you clearly see outliers, again uh, marked uh, yellow, uh, which could mean that there is a uh, lack of consistency, but it could also mean that there is, uh, uh, that there is another reason for this, this, these huge differences. For example, business restructurings, or assets being moved to uh, to other jurisdictions, uh, intangible assets. There can be many reasons, but this is for an uh, for tax authorities easy way of looking uh, uh, whether there are any outliers or, or tax risk indicators. So, like for example, if you see uh, this, uh, jurisdiction I, there we have 337 in, uh, increase in related party revenue, and uh, Profit before tax uh, went up by 44%, uh, but the income tax accrued was almost static at zero, no change, and the number of employees only increased by 25%, so much less than the increase in almost half, half of the increase in profits, and and a significant increase in related party revenue. So that's a clear indication that uh, this would be a case of more like some restructuring because. Uh, inconsistency will not throw such uh, big changes in percentages. So the next step will be for uh, tax authority to again check other sources of documentation to find uh, what were the exact reasons for such high changes in percentages. So this uh, table is doing uh, exactly the same as the previous table. It's looking at the differences between 16 and 17. The only difference is that this is looking at the differences in ratios uh, derived from uh, from table one. So the same story, I think, is uh, is applicable to this table. Again, consistency is important, and uh, it's an easy way for tax authorities to look at uh, any tax risk indicators. So the next uh, topic which we we are discussing here is. Uh, use of table 3 and uh, as we know that uh, uh, table 1 and table 2 they give us more like quantitative data and table 2 is tells us very broadly uh, what functions uh, each uh, uh, jurisdiction is, is performing and table 3 gives an opportunity to the taxpayers to uh, disclose where any classification has to be made in reference to Table 1 and Table 2. Now, when we look at CBCR, automating CBCR is, is very important for tax authorities. So one can still automate the, the, the data information, but to automate words, phrases, and uh, textual information, which should be part of Table 3, will be, we expect will be difficult uh, in the next two to three years unless some standardized uh, words and phrases are formed, which companies can use to explain their table 1 and table 2 uh, in, in table 3. So what are the key uh, textual information we expect for uh, table 3? One is it is important to uh, define what is the safe source of your data. Did you use data from your uh, statutory financials or is it from your uh, regulatory filings or was that from your management accounts? And consistency is very important. So if you use any spec specific set of uh, financials, then you should use for the subsequent years as well. Because in the previous slide, we saw that tax authorities will be very inclined to do multi-year analysis once they have 
second, third year of CYC uh, uh, reports available with them. Next important item we should, we should explain in table three is about level of consolidation. As we know that uh, when we have to uh, present our data for uh, CYC for different jurisdictions, then we have to uh, uh, follow aggregate approach so that we can show that uh, each jurisdiction has related party revenue. Another jurisdiction also has related party revenue, but there are uh, companies who file their uh, uh, financial data for tax return on a consolidated basis for specific jurisdiction. So in those cases, uh, those companies are allowed to uh, produce data for specific jurisdiction on consolidation basis. So this clarification has to be uh, made in table, uh, table three. Another uh, important disclosure which is required is whether your FTs include uh, only the employees who are on the payroll of the company or do they include the contractors as well so that the tax authorities can see the consistency in the presentation of data in the subsequent years. Another uh, important example is uh, to produce uh, as a disclosure in table three is to mention that if uh, there's any specific country where your intercompany pricing is governed by some regulatory restrictions like what we see in case of uh, Brazil. So if we have a specific uh, uh, low level of profits but we have high number of FTs, but that is because of the regulatory restrictions, it's very important to uh, mention that uh, in, your, uh, in, your table, in your table three. So the, the, the whole message is that this table three will be an important a determinant for you to ensure that the information present there is clear enough and wherever there are any false uh, false positive as this uh, phrase is used in this uh, in this uh, in this manual those false positive which say that there is a potential risk but there is actually no risk so if you can uh, make this clarification in table 3 it can stop you to getting into an extensive uh, audit uh, proceedings with the tax authorities because then they will ask you to produce local file and then you get a notice and then you have to go and uh, and actually uh, undergo the audit proceeding. So table C will be very important and we expect that in the subsequent years we have a more clarity what standard, what standard text can be used in table 3. Uh, now as we know that uh, uh, CBC are the first level of uh, data by which will be used by uh, tax authorities to uh, uh, do initial risk assessment. But then there are other sources of information which they will be using wherever they have to take a conclusive decision on whether to go ahead with the audit or uh, tax audit or not. Now there are basically four set of sources of data which tax authorities would uh, would look at. One is the data which belongs to the multinational so which is about tax return uh, any filings which are made uh, for for example details of interest dividends royalties paid which you file in local country and obviously master file and local file and other tp forms so that's the source of data which is basically a, a country specific entity specific within the multinational second set of uh, data which they will look at is through government uh, sources, which there are other departments, they have the data. Now, as we know that customs and transpressing, uh, they have two divergent uh, objectives, but in, in today's time, a lot of data is being shared between two departments. So that will be another set of data which they will be using along with uh, the data what you provide to them as your own data, like master file, local file, and tax returns. And the third set of data which they will be looking at is what is there uh, available publicly? They will look at uh, uh, financial reports of, uh, of, for example, what your group has present on on, uh, on publicly if you're a listed company. They will also look at stock exchange in public filing because I remember one case which I uh, I worked for a client where they made a disclosure in uh, uh, in on 10K in the U.S. that the patents originated in that specific developing country. But that developing country was a cost plus entity. But officer picked up that information and initiated audit, and they said the patents was originated in that country. But in today's world, we have to look at DMP functions. We cannot just go by the assumption that it 
the patent originated in that country. So, and then there are also occasions where tax authorities would look at a LinkedIn profile or they will look at what are the job uh, advertise, advertisements which company puts in the local country to attract talent. So these are the sources they will be looking at. And then also commercially available information, many tax authorities, they have license to financial databases. They will look at the data in it. They will also look at uh, what other comparables are earning besides comparing your C by C report with the C by C report filed by other multinationals. But I believe that that comparison is not right or would not be right because there are a lot of differences how company would report their numbers and also there are differences in their business strategies, the function, assets and risk. So comparing C by C report would not be a right thing, but I would imagine that tax authorities would still do it to check uh, initial uh, tax indicators. Now, after uh, going through, uh, in the previous slide, we shared with you that uh, what different tax indicators are possible. Now, it is very important for you to uh, do some uh, analysis, some uh, 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 CBSCR risk analysis, or we call that as outlier analysis, where it's very important for you to check how your numbers, they look like. So the most important uh, uh, risk indicators, which we we expect are very useful to check for, for by any multinational is looking at your profit margin in each country, looking at your uh, uh, effective tax rate, and when you look at profit margin, you should not stop. Uh, you should not stop only at jurisdiction. You should even go by 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 a specific entity. So you check for each entity in that country, and then it can tell you that whether there are some outliers or not. And uh, I would call this. I would call this more like a, an, a more like an additive approach, which means that you look at your own data and you check uh, how, what your numbers look like, but then you also pick up your knowledge on your competitors and also some comparables and try to find out uh, what's, uh, uh, what data, what risk indicators they are having. Are you very much aware from the tax indicators which these, uh, your competitors or comparables are having? And then, uh, and then it's also important to look at uh, other risk indicators where if you look at the growth rate of your sales, if that is, uh, that is uh, going up but your profits are down, this could be uh, because of some business strategy you have in local country, for example, market penetration strategy. So you want to have a lower profits because you want to be aggressive in the market, you're looking for volumes, and then later, your profits, uh, you will be back in profits. So this analysis, you cannot just do on, on, on your one year data. You need to look at multiple year. Now, as we know that we are, uh, the, for the first time we are submitting C by CR reports, it will be important to even apply these risk indicators to your past year data. So just go back to two years and check, you know, how the numbers are moving up and down. So that will give you a good grip before you uh, get any uh, questions from the tax authorities. Thank so you, Virendra. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Virendra. Yeah. Um, one other element that uh, might be, uh, you know, useful for you, and this is what we refer to as a tip number eight, to synchronize whatever you report in CBC with what you effectively know of your own global value chain. As such, you know, try to match up what you have in CBC with your own value chain analysis. Now, is your value chain analysis telling the same story? It's really what this is all about. Um, I think it's a bit uh, one needs to understand if you look at all the reporting that you're doing today it's all about financial year 16 which has been closed the year is gone over you have reflected in your financial reports you know the way you were reporting as before and all these CBC reports are based on that so these reports do not necessarily reflect what OECD is now basically looking at in terms of 
you know, the value chain and where value is created in particular, looking at what is now being added as the significant people functions uh, element. In the past, we used to talk about substance, where substance was not necessarily defined. So a lot of people uh, have been always saying, if you have substance, read FTEs, that should be more than enough. I think the OECD in this context has refined substance to be more specific in the sense of significant people and really the people that make decisions and create the value. So if you report what you have reported already, basically CBCR is not more than just a reflection of what you have reported in the financial accounts you probably would do yourselves a very good favor to start doing your quantitative analysis for the value chain. A lot of uh, companies in the master file have included already a value chain. One has done it more elaborate than the other. There is also reference in the master file that you have to include you know, your five biggest products or units. You have to uh, give an indication of how do the people functions spread over this value chain into which jurisdictions and you know it is that last bit is to translate the significant people functions back into the jurisdictions um, by adding you know basically well actually to say it in a different way if your group has 15 percent EBIT consolidated how does this EBIT spread over uh, the countries if you apply the methodology of looking at the significant people that actually create the value. Where do these people sit and actually perform their position, their role, their function? And how much would you allocate of the EBIT to each of these functions, thus to each of these significant people? And in which countries would then the result be booked in terms of who will get more EBIT? And here on this slide 25, you see on the left hand side this uh, nice pie chart, which is a reflection of your you know, basically your financial report. And on the right hand side, it's one done based on a quantitative value chain analysis. And you will not be surprised that you can see deltas between the two. And those deltas are then basically indicating, again, the information that we discussed before with all these ratio analysis, country N is in the context of your CBC report and getting a nice piece of the margin, look at 42% as an argument, but if there are not enough significant people in the game for that specific country N, you know, it should not be making the 42% as here in the picture, but on the right hand side it should be making maybe the 20%. So f that means that more than half of that margin that is allocated in your reports and your external uh, financial report and in calculating your ETR should actually be reallocated over the other countries. This you can only find if you start doing a quantitative value chain analysis where you forget about how you booked it but where you try to assess which functions create what component of value i.e. how much of the EBIT should be allocated to those functions and how does that function translate into you know, where do the significant people sit within that function and how does that translate into the jurisdiction where then the profit should be allocated. This is one of those elements where this will tell you where your risks are. At least it will give an indication of whether you have uh, really risks or whether you're nicely aligned. And if you do have risk, how you know how to act on it will be then the next step and maybe it even indicates opportunities so again I think the next stage could be and this is definitely a recommendation that we can bring is to do a quantitative value chain on top of this qualitative value chain analysis that you have already done for purposes of your um, for your master file and um, this will also then indicate the areas where to focus where to make remedies and that will hopefully help you to get a better uh, ratio analysis and less red flags 
um, that you know we discussed earlier that may come from uh, the CBC report and the approach that the tax authorities are taking to analyze these, uh, uh, these CBC data. Okay, can we go to the next slide please? Because I used the word red flag already. Um, again, you know, it's we can say it's our recommendation, but I think it's more common sense in terms of what the recommendation is, which is tip nine. You know, be proactive. I think if you wait and sit and see what happens, which some companies really do, well, then brace yourselves. Um, there's a lot out there, and you know, we always refer to the you know, the tax buy as a nice chocolate cake, uh, but after BEPS, there is a lot of countries out there that believe that if we come to 10 uh, to the party, that not everybody should get one tenth, but we all should be getting a quarter, which means there are not enough cakes. To translate that in other words, you will probably end up with double taxation if you are not careful. So again, you know, one of the tips is deal with this in a very proactive way. And if we go to the next slide, um, you know, the, the argument could be numerous. There could be numerous elements that you can do, but, you know, create your pre-defense files is one point. Uh, prepare your cases where you can see that you have a risk given the new rules around BEPS, especially if you take significant people functions versus FTEs. Um, how would you look at potentially settling what is your way that you could you know go through the audit without too much pain and too much hassle you know you could even say if I'm proactive I could do maybe multilateral or unilateral APAs uh, can I go more proactively towards the tax authorities and say guys look um, it looks like we may have an issue in a country where you go then and actually maybe run a different tax return versus what you actually have in your books. In other words, in your tax return, you may indicate already uh, that there is an area of contest. Um, but, you know, that's, that's all questions that you need to start answering for yourself if you can find, due, due to review of red flag ratios, maybe the value chain, the quantitative value chain analysis, maybe you will find areas where you say, we have to take actions, and this, is just a framework on how you could deal with this, but do it proactively and don't wait until it comes because it will be a fire drill and you will not like the fire drill uh, typically. Now, one of the things that, you know, if, if you think about the 19 indicators uh, that we mentioned at the beginning, obviously there's a couple of them that create um, a, a red flag, but if you wait Let's, let's draw maybe a timeline, if you just wait, what happens? The CBC for the financial year 16 will be filed at the end of this year, so that's already year 17, so suddenly we have already two years passing. Tax authorities, if they are fast, they will pick it up somewhere, you know, during the financial year number 18, they will go and ask, uh, ask, ask questions, you will give some answers before you actually get maybe to discuss and even close any open points that relate to still financial year 16, you might already be in year 19 or 2020. What does that mean? That means that once you come to a closure or a settlement in those years, you still have financial year 17, 18 and 19 open, which may have a similar reflection. So again, my argument of waiting can be painful and it would suggest to address this more proactively. Um, that's tip number nine. Can we go to tip number two? When you file your country by country report, yeah, you can file it in an XML form with, uh, with your country or your surrogate country, but at the same time, what are some of the recommendations that we would bring to you? Um, you know, this is confidential data. If we go to page number 29, please, uh, Victor. <clears throat> Obviously, this is confidential information. You don't want this to be landing on the street. Um, so how can you avoid public disclosure? Can you avoid it? You know, some countries are probably less tight than others. Um, but what we would, you know, probably uh, recommend is that 
when you write to the tax authorities, or you probably should write a letter to your tax authority saying, guys, we assume that you will treat this with all confidence and uh, confidentiality, and that you will not give it to any authority that is not uh, following sort of the ISO certification route that is indicated in this um, uh, in the report, because the authorities amongst themselves and the OECD is giving a reference that tax authorities should actually be looking at handing over CBC information to those tax authorities in those countries that have call it this sort of an ISO certification or an ISO process of dealing with data to at least have some assurance that those authorities receiving the information don't leak it to whomever um, which could be a journalist, which could be somebody else, and then it's in the public domain, which is maybe not what you want because, you know, there may be very confidential information from a pure uh, commercial perspective. For privately owned companies, it may even be an element of, you know, security for the families behind those companies that they don't want all this uh, information on the street. So, you know, make sure with a letter that at least you try to cover yourself in saying we assume that you will follow all these nice rules if not you know we might be coming back and, and hold you liable is that gonna hold up in court who knows but not doing it means you've forgiven all your opportunity there so our recommendation or tip number 10 is make sure that you state that in your letter when you offer the CBC to the authorities um, that you actually claim uh, sorry, that you basically request from them and demand from them uh, that they follow all these nice rules that OECD is indicating to secure confidentiality of the data that you're sharing. Obviously, if the uh, EU comes up with public disclosure, then it's the law, then you are, you are bound by it. But for the interim period until that time, um, this could be one way to, uh, you know, at least put some pressure on the system. This basically concludes our 10 tips on this whole uh, CBC filing. Um, if you have any questions, and actually forgot to say that at the beginning, if you have any questions, you can put into the chat box your questions, and we would be more than happy to answer them. We probably have time for two or three questions, so please, if you have any uh, write them down and we're more than happy to answer or separately you can always uh, send us an email uh, if you want to have another separate discussion on some of the topics that were addressed during this webinar. Uh, one question is that uh, is this value chain analysis uh, so important especially quantitative to carry along with the CBSCR? Uh, well, I think if you if if you would ask me that question, Virenda, which I'm taking uh, the, the liberty, yeah, yeah. I I I personally have have been involved now in quantitative um, analyses, and I think you will be surprised what you will find. And I think it's that surprise that you want to get out of the way. I think you want to make sure that you know how potentially the um, uh, the quantitative VCA will look like. And there is always, in a, in, in a VCA, quantitative VCA, there is always some kind of level of subjectivity, but at the same time, you, you cannot be that wrong. So I always take a bit of, you know, a 10% up or down uh, of the values that come out. But even there, at least it starts, again, to give some indications that you might have a mismatch uh, of where value is created using the significant people, not the FTE base, but the significant people. and that is where the tax authorities really are, you know, that, that's what they're chasing. That's what they want to get their hands on. They want to know where is the value created. And I think if you do that analysis, um, at least you have uh, now a tool in your hands to start understanding how to act and respond to tax authorities starting to asking you questions. You can at least create now a very consistent story of where the functions are, where the value is created and in which countries these are created by also using then the quantitative value chain analysis as evidence and support, which you obviously then need to document, but that's, that's then the element that gives you more power vis-a-vis -vis the authorities because how would they be able to do it 
different. They can still make a different statement. They feel, you know, based on local files that they can come up with different statements. But all the factual information of what people do, even in the local countries, you should you should try to bring into um, into this equation. And to the extent there are significant people in those countries, you need to you know pull it in and and assign a proper part of your EBIT to that activity. Uh, so I personally believe that a quantitative value chain analysis can be an extremely good basis for uh, countering any tax authorities, but at the same time it can clearly show uh, your mismatches as well from what you are reporting, which you know some indicators through you know these ratio analysis we discussed that could have come up. So it's it's an extremely good defense file, but it also creates an opportunity file. And also. Uh uh, doing value chain analysis uh, quantitatively also brings us closer to how my operating model runs and it brings our knowledge as a tax professional uh, and we get into the shoes of business people and then we understand how my value chain looks like from a numbers point and especially where if I think that I have a transaction where that transaction is a routine transaction and I'm paying on a cost plus basis so I should see a less uh, likelihood of challenge from the tax authorities, but possibly I'm too much cost center and cost center is inefficient. So if I look at my overall profit in the value chain, I can even uh, possibly find them as uh, red flags, or although on the face value they don't look like a red flag because they're more like cost center. So I I would imagine that this value chain analysis, especially the quantitative technique, is a very useful tool to understand uh, from numbers perspective, not only for the entities who are, take the residual profit, but also for entities who are more like cost centers or revenue centers who just take routine, uh, share, routine share in the profit. Thank and you, Zorana. Have... Gentlemen, I think um, it is now a couple of minutes after five. I think we need to start closing off. I want to thank everybody for joining this uh, this webinar and as I said before if you have any further questions or would like to have a further conversation please send us a note and uh, we will be more than happy to follow up with you and with this I want to close the session thank you very much and hope to have you attending uh, the next webinar thank you very much <laughs>